Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, co-host of MECFS Alert. Over the past many weeks, I have been talking here in Silicon Valley at a place called Mountain View with Dr. Andreas Kogelink, who is the founder and the inspiration and the driving force behind a new but ambitious clinic called the Open Medicine Institute. What are the messages that you would send, uh, Andy? Everybody calls him Andy. What would you send to the patients, to those people who are in such deleterious situations, and that to keep them going, to, to give them hope, and to let them know that people like you care and are working very hard on their behalf? Well, I think there's a, certainly a lot more than just me uh, making an effort here, and uh, both here in the Institute as well as elsewhere in, in the world. And one of the key things I think that's changed in the last year is really that there are more and more serious researchers and serious physicians getting into this area. And there's a, a lot of reason to be hopeful. And some of the progress that's been made in the last year, to me, holds more promise in the field than, than there has been for 30 years. So I think, uh, you know, to the patients, I would say, hold on to your hats and, you know, hopefully in the next uh, coming year, year or two, we'll be able to, to really start diving into some of these promises and make them reality. People who correspond with me and people who phone me up since I've been writing and, and broadcasting on CFS say, where is Big Pharma? They have this idea that here you've got a very prevalent, widespread disease that is with people for a long time, which means a lot of treatment. Where are the pharmaceutical companies? Are they doing research? Don't they want to come up and patent a drug or a treatment or a, a therapy that will help? Uh, and yet they seem to be astoundingly absent. Well, I think research in this area is difficult, and it's difficult in particular for the pharmas. Um, but that said, we've taken it back to them, and we've been working with several pharmas for about a year now to try to get their interest and get their engagement on this. Uh, we, we have two actually very promising trials that uh, we're hoping to, to put into play in the next six months. Uh, and then we have a larger trial. We've had a discussion around rituxan and a large multinational uh, What are the trial. two trials? Uh, well, I can't quite talk about them yet, but maybe for a future episode uh, we, we can get into that. Okay. And then you went into the rituxan trial, and how large is that going to be? Well, uh, this is this is a drug that is in the marketplace. It is, and there's if, there's if I have if I have a certain cancer, I can get this drug. That's right. But if I have CFS, I can't get this drug. Well, well we, not easily. Not easily. We're we're doing it here for. Also, I have to sell my house to have that's right. two weeks of treatment. It's so expensive. It's an expensive drug, but we're doing it here for as a as a small pilot right now, just sort of empiric usage based on the Norwegian study, and we've extended that uh, in a number of ways, and we're working with the Norwegians and others to, to set up a multi-center trial. Uh, and there's a number of ways we can do this. We can fund it through uh, pharma, or we can actually go out and get other funding for it uh, independently, and, and we're running down both tracks. The um, other drug, which is again in trials and seems to have been in trials on and off for quite a long time, is Ambien. Uh, Ampligen. Ampligen. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, is Ampligen, and uh, uh, but these are two very small things in a very large ocean of suffering. Well, one of the things that we've looked at since the uh, rituxan data came out is looking more broadly at all kinds of immunologic agents and, and other agents as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things on the table right now. I think what needs to happen is that there needs to be some good science behind those things, and we need to validate that they work. These, a lot of these are very dangerous drugs, and we can't just throw them out there at, at just anybody. But these are people who, are, to themselves, are dead, or they're in such an awful state that they often think it would be better to be dead, and I'm told there's a fairly high suicide rate. Mm -hmm. This is not a joke. This is not, a, this is not the common cold. Uh, I, I think if I asked 100 CFS ME patients uh, whether they would like rituxan or not, uh, I think, despite the, the risk of death and other side effects, uh, I think I would probably have a well over a 95% response rate based on the patients I've talked to so far. Which would say, go ahead, even Which if it's go dangerous. Ahead. Absolutely. Uh, that's my experience. I haven't found anybody, although I'm not in any sense a medical person, 
but I haven't, as a reporter, found anybody who wouldn't take anything, no matter how dangerous, to stop the suffering. And we saw some of the same things with valcite. Uh, you know, there's a black box warning for cancer with valcite, and yet the majority of patients moved on through valcite uh, despite that. What is the what is the process for a clinical trial? Well, uh, first you have to have an idea and, and, and sort of vet it scientifically in terms of making, creating a rigorous process, which we call a protocol, uh, that gets followed if, for each and every patient and all the exceptions around uh, that patient. And then we enroll patients, explain to them the risks and the possible benefits. And uh, in, in an ideal trial, it's a placebo-controlled trial. So some patients get the drug and some patients get a sham of the drug, and then we compare the two at the end. Uh, for us, we want to put as many markers on that as possible, so we're collecting genomic level molecular data uh, to compare what did this person's immune system look like at the start and what do they look like at the end, and how do they compare with normal patients. When a doctor hands <coughs> out a placebo, is there a sense of guilt? No, because it's you're not handing out a placebo for something that's known. You're trying to demonstrate whether something truly works in a patient population or not. And if, if we knew it worked, absolutely there would be a guilt, and I think that would be unethical if we knew it worked. But, but part of what we're doing is trying to demonstrate that it works beyond a doubt. I might just say for the benefit of the viewers that I'm old enough that I remember thalidomide, and I did some writing about it in England 50 years ago about that, uh, where, which was truly terrible. This was a drug that has other uses, but it was given to pregnant women, and children were born without arms, without legs, with one limb missing. It was pretty awful because they hadn't been tested well enough. But that doesn't actually apply here, does it, where you have a known illness and people prepared to take a risk. There no, none of these people are going to have children immediately. Or well, it, it applies to a certain degree in that that, that experience led to sort of a, a, the birth of the FDA approval process that we have now in part. And so we go through a process similar to that uh, in terms of vetting a drug and seeing whether it's ethically uh, appropriate to be giving that drug to, to patients. Are we seeing uh, people uh, shopping for, for things that will help them overseas? Uh, given that any of these two, either of these two drugs we've mentioned are horrendously, unbelievably expensive, that uh, people who could afford them can probably also afford to go and get them in Norway or, or Germany, where I think one is also available. I don't know where Amplogen is available. Well, I, I think in terms of Rituxan, I think the Norwegians and we both take a very uh, conservative view in that we are really limiting the number of patients right now who, who we're taking into any studies or, or any empiric usage. And, and we want to do it in a controlled, scientifically valid uh, uh, way. Uh, in a in a larger picture, uh, yeah, I think that there are certainly uh, uh, cautionary tales that have to be be addressed in terms of you you can't just broadly throw something out at a population when there's potential downsides to a drug. To conclude, Andy, people who want to get in touch with you, how should they do that? Uh, well, we have a website with our contact information: www.openmedicineinstitute.org. Uh, so they can go there. We'll be opening up a public registry there shortly, uh, and, and our biobank is also accessible through that. Uh, and uh, we would love to hear from you. Good luck to you. Many people are hoping you'll succeed. Thanks so much. If you would like to sponsor MECFS Alert, please contact us at mecfsalert at gmail.com. Help us to help you.